by the way, you can see the picture there of the helmet, right? They're brilliant, the brilliant light shone, I'm at the uh, top of the page on 55. The brilliant light shone suddenly as though burning in that hall and as bright as heaven's own candle lit in the sky. He looked at her home, then following along the wall, went walking, his hands tight on the sword, his heart still angry. He was hunting another dead monster and took his weapon with him for final revenge against Grendel's vicious attacks, his nightmare raids over and over, coming to Herod when Hrothgar's men slept, killing them in their beds, eating some on the spot, 15 or more, and running to his loathsome moor with another such sickening meal waiting in his pouch. But Beowulf repaid him for those visits, found him lying dead in his corner, armless. Who is he found? So he's down in the mother's lair. Who's he looking for? Looking for Grendel. Where I, who, Grendel, Grendel did what? Pulled away, remember, and then went back to the lair without his arm and there died. And Beowulf is like, oh no, you don't. You don't get away so easy. And take a look at now what happens next. Exactly as that fierce fighter, line 560, had sent him out from Hera, then struck off his head with a single swift blow. So what are we going to do here? We're going to cut off Grendel's head, right? This is this whole thing about trophies. Why do you put the head of something on a wall? It's a way to remember the battle, remember the conquest, right? The body jerked for the last time, then lay still. The wise old warriors who surrounded Hrothgar, like him staring into the monster's lake, saw the waves surging and blood spurting through. Now, this is an interesting bit of storytelling, so let's pause for a moment at 2B and make an observation. Our poet is pretty sophisticated. He doesn't forget that our story actually has two movements. What's happening subterranean, that is to say, Beowulf and Grendel's mom, but there's another group of people who are waiting for Beowulf up above. And the whole time you go, oh yeah. Remember, Beowulf made his comment, dude, I'm going to go down there, I'm going to jack this, this old lady, but if I don't come back, give my stuff back to my king. And then he jumps into the water and he swims down. Question, while he's been doing all of this, what have they been doing up above? See? Now, of course, you're familiar in movies, and you can write down really quickly at 3A, if it comes to mind quickly, a movie where it does this, where they cut back and forth. And you know it's happening simultaneously, but they cut back and forth, yes? So you've got the action happening, and then all of a sudden they cut away, and they show you the other people, right, who are kind of like, whoa, 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 what's going on? The minute that he cuts off the head of Grendel, Blood comes up in the water. What is the assumption? See, think about this. What is the assumption? The assumption is, of course, oh no, Beowulf's dead. Oh man, right? So the poet here is kind of playing a little game with us, and it's a fairly sophisticated bit of storytelling. Let's go ahead and keep going. I'm on page 55, line 566. They spoke about Beowulf, all the graybeards, whispering together and said that, Hope was gone, that the hero had lost fame in his life at once and would never return to the living, coming back as triumphant as he had left. Almost all agreed that Grendel's mighty mother, the she-wolf, had killed him. In other words, no way. And again, this is good storytelling, right? Oh, he's dead. He hasn't, he's been down there a long time. And now we see blood. Clearly he's dead. He, he's, gonna, he's not going to come back. It's sad. It's all over. Notice they were called graybeards. What does graybeards mean? The old people. In other words, the young Beowulf cannot pull this off. They're skeptical of the young kid's ability to pull it off. And of course, we can think about movies where the young man is going to attempt something that the old people go, yeah, it can't be done. And the young man's going to have to do it in spite of the skepticism. Keep reading with me. I'm on page 55, line 573. The sun slid over past noon, went further down. The Danes, uh-oh, look at this one. Read it with me. Line uh, 574. The Danes gave up, left the lake, and went home. Rothgar with them. No way. So in, in other words, they're like, well, I guess sucks to be him. Well, he gave it his best shot, and then he got jacked. We'll all go home. Fascinating. They just go ahead and walk away. Keep reading. However, look who stays. The Geats stay. Now, who are the Geats? They're those warriors that came with Beowulf from Geekland, right? In other words, the warriors, the friends of Beowulf, do not leave. The other people leave, 
but his pals do not leave. Let's pause for a moment at 2a. This is obviously one of the famous messages from this text. A true friend doesn't leave in the time of the battle, right? The true friend stays. Now let's make an observation here that in Beowulf part three, we're gonna see this notion again of the true friend, the one who takes care of, right? And tries to help out his pal. The Geats stayed, sat sadly watching, imagining they saw their Lord, but not believing they would ever see him again. Then, back now down below, back down now below. Then the sword <coughs> melted, blood soaked, dripping down like water, disappearing like ice when the world's eternal Lord loosens invisible fetters and unwinds icicles and frost as only he can. He who rules time and seasons. He who is truly God. Well, let's pause for a moment because sometimes this is misunderstood. When Beowulf cuts off Grendel's head, Grendel's blood is so yucky, it melts the sword blade. Ooh, it melts the sword blade. It destroys the sword, leaving only the handle of the sword, right? The monster's hall, last lines on page 55. The monster's hall was full of rich treasures, but all that Beowulf took was Grendel's head and the hilt of the giant's jeweled sword. The rest of that ring-marked blade had dissolved in Grendel's steaming blood, boiling even after his death. Whoa. So let's pause for a moment and point out <coughs> Beowulf, after killing Grendel's mother, only wants two things. All this treasure down there, but he only wants two things. What are those two things? One, Grendel's head. Two, he will take the hilt of that famous sword. Looking at that handle will tell you what kind of sword that must have been. The weapon is, of course, special for him. All right, let's finish up. And then the battle's only survivor swam up and away from those silent corpses. The water was calm and clean, the whole huge lake peaceful once the demons who lived in it were dead. So let's pause for a moment at level one and just make a quick observation. Notice you have here then the development of the storyline, right? So in other words, everybody's gone except for Beowulf's pals, right? And Beowulf will swim up. Notice how nature now is calm. Jot down in your notes, what do you think is going on here? What is being suggested here? That before the fire, fiery lake, nasty, nasty monsters everywhere, now everything's restored to calm and tranquility. Jot down a two way. What do you think's going on with this? What do you think's happening here? <clears throat> Lots of possible answers. One of them is, of course, that when Beowulf has taken care of business, nature is now restored calm again, right? Everything is working out. All right, let's finish out this passage now on page 56. <clears throat> then that noble protector of all seamen swam to land, rejoicing in the heavy burdens he was bringing with him. He and all his glorious band of geats thanked God that their leader had come back unharmed. They left the lake together. The geats carried Beowulf's helmet, and his mail shirt, behind them the water slowly thickened as the monster's blood came seeping up. They walked quickly, happily across the roads, all of them remembered, left the lake and the cliffs alongside it. Brave men staggering under the weight of Grendel's skull, too heavy for fewer than four of them to handle. Two on each side of the spear jammed through it, yet proud of their ugly load and determined that the Danes seated in Herod should see it. Let's pause for a moment. This is how strong Beowulf is. And this is how large Grendel, the monster, was. When Beowulf cuts off Grendel's head and swims with it to the surface of the lake, it takes four soldiers to carry the head. That's how large the head of this monster is. It says something, of course, about Beowulf again. He is a superhero, right? Superhero. Let's finish now. Soon... Fourteen geats arrived at the hall, bold and warlike, and with Beowulf, their lord and leader, they walked on the mead hall green. Then the geats' brave prince entered Herod, covered with glory for the daring battles he had fought. He sought Hrothgar to salute him and show Grendel's head. He carried that terrible trophy by the hair, brought it straight to where the Danes sat, drinking, the queen among them. It was a weird and wonderful sight, and the warriors stared. Now, let's just finish here really quickly with a couple of quick observations. Notice, 
after Beowulf does what he does, he wants to make sure to show the Danes, I did it. I told you I'd do it, I did it. He brings with him the head of Grindel as a trophy, and he says, see, I did it. Notice the word weird is used, right? Weird. Strange and amazement, right? Notice as well that Beowulf will want to prove, I did the impossible. You thought I had failed, but I didn't fail. I was able to, I was able to do it. Jump down to 3A really quickly. What is your favorite movie? Where at the end, for a few seconds at least, you're led to think that the hero has failed, and then all of a sudden, the hero shows up successfully. In other words, you go, oh, well, I guess he got jacked. And then all of a sudden, maybe he'll come out from the fire, or she'll step out of a room or something, you're like, oh, no way, you made it. Oh, that's so awesome, right? This kind of storytelling takes us all the way back to the time of Beowulf. Let's finish our annotations now with some quick observations. At 2A, major messages and themes. Jot down at least one that works for you. Several possible uh, you know, ideas here. One, a true warrior will finish what he promises to finish. Two, real friends stay with their true friends. Right? All the other Danes will leave, but not Beowulf's. Not Beowulf's warriors, those, or those total of 14, right, who show back up, right? We could, of course, by extrapolation, say it to a, that great things only happen with lots of hard work, and we might say a little bit of luck. Beowulf had to have that sword hanging on a wall down there to be able to finally accomplish the goal, the mission, right? Let's talk really quickly at 2B. We've mentioned several for your annotations already, but let's jot down a couple of other ideas. Notice the amazing storytelling here. The Beowulf poet has a real sense of timing, has a real sense of perspective, is trying to give us some sense of suspense, using a bit of foreshadowing as he goes, right? We've already mentioned a number, a number of 3A observations, relationships to other titles. Many students pointing out, whoa, this poem has had tremendous influence in Western culture and in film and in video game creation and the like. Finally, let's jot down really quickly this question at 3B. What is for you the greatest thing you've ever accomplished that you wanted to show someone you had done it? That is to say, you wanted to arrive with the head of Grindel. And when you arrived with the head of Grindel, it was weird. People were amazed. They were like, yeah, no, no, you did not do that. And you're like, did it. And I got evidence to show you I did it. Take that, if you will, right? Our storytelling now is going to take us from Beowulf Part 2 to Beowulf Part 3. When we come back... We'll join now Beowulf in his final, his final exploits. Thank you.